Hello and welcome to the British Undergraduate Review. I'm Arden Foster Spink, and today I'm delighted to be joined by Sir Vince Cable. Sir Vince was formerly the Liberal Democrat Member of Parliament for Twickenham. Until last year, he was leader of the Liberal Democrats, and before that served as Secretary of State for Business, Innovation and Skills. Sir Vince, thank you very much for joining me. Pleasure. Okay. I want to start off by taking you back, if I may, 54 years ago. You were 23 and had a tremendous amount of responsibility as a Treasury official in um, Kenya. Do you think that role left you with an appetite for more responsibility? Or had you already decided you wanted to become a Member of Parliament before then? Uh, yes, it was, it was one of these unusual um, kind of life opportunities that was probably rather unique. Uh, there was a, a scheme, in fact it still exists, called the Overseas Development Institute Fellowship Scheme, where uh, young graduates, uh, economics graduates, uh, go off to developing countries uh, to fill gaps in the administration. Um, and it just happened in the um, mid-60s, when I graduated uh, from Cambridge, um, that you know, quite a few African countries were becoming independent. A lot of the white expatriates were leaving or were being encouraged to leave, and quite senior positions were being left behind unfilled because the cohort of young African graduates hadn't come through the system. So I was, in a way, plugging a hole in the Kenya Treasury, waiting for you know, talented young Africans to, to come along. And it was a, you know, once and for all opportunity. I mean, as it happens, the scheme was supposed to be self-liquidating um, as colonialism um, receded into history, but actually it hasn't worked out that way because uh, what has happened in a lot of countries, they you know, they're bright young things, then went off to work in the World Bank or the African Development Bank, uh, went into business, and so their civil service um, uh, specialists tend to be depleted. So actually there's been a growing demand for the ODI scheme rather than declining demand. But I, I was very, very lucky. I, I was actually over-promoted. I mean, I was a you know, rather green, um, inexperienced. Um, I, I, I'd never previously used my economics in any practical context and was suddenly plunged into a position of responsibility. So, but I love being in Kenya, I love the people. I got married there at the time of my life and I learned a lot. I think I probably got much more out of it than Kenya did, but <laughs> it certainly you know, whetted my appetite for serious, serious jobs. You mentioned the economics <laughs> graduate. graduate. I, I just got a bit of feedback there. No, it's fine now. You mentioned being an economics graduate. You, of course, you switched from natural sciences while you're at Cambridge. Why did you do that? Um, well, I was a sort of moderately competent scientist, but um, not brilliant. Um, I didn't, I mean, my comp maths was adequate enough to get onto the natural science course, but I wasn't a star mathematician. Uh, and above all, I was interested in university and dabbling in other things. I was interested in politics, uh, drama, uh, had girlfriends, all kind of stuff, um, and spending the life, the morning in lecture, the afternoon in laboratories, was not my kind of lifestyle, uh, and uh, I couldn't see myself making a career there, so I switched to economics, which I was interested in anyway, from a kind of public affairs standpoint. Uh, well, as a young man, you were a member of the Liberal Party, and then, of course, you switched to standing uh, as a Labour candidate for Parliament when I think you're about 28. And then you switched back sometime afterwards to the SDP. Um, how did you go about choosing your political allegiance? And oh, what my, yeah, my political views haven't really changed all that much since I was an undergraduate, actually. And I was always what I would loosely call centre-left, a kind of social democratic stroke liberal. I mean, the problem is not I think not so much me though there may be a problem with me is that that is you know that's long been the kind of fault line in British politics uh, a kind of area of competition between Labour and Liberal Democrats in their earlier form I mean when I was an undergraduate I tried to get a merger between the the University Liberal Club 
and a group of social democrats from the Labour Party who were becoming increasingly uncomfortable, even in the 1960s, let alone the Jeremy Corbyn era. Um, um, but it all fell apart because of kind of tribal um, sectarian outlook. Um, so I got rather disillusioned. Um, in the subsequent election in 1966, I campaigned for Harold Wilson, who seemed the most plausible um, candidate to be prime minister in sort of Labour. Um, and that, so that's how I started my active involvement in politics as opposed to student politics. And, and do you think your study of economics kind of in some way informed your political views or, or was it maybe the other way around in your politics and your, by which I mean, I suppose your sense of right and wrong kind of tainted in some way your economic outlook? I think it was more that way around. Um, and if I, you, th these names may not mean much to the current generation, but there was a, a writer called J.K. Galbraith who was an advisor to the Kennedy administration, wrote very good prose. And he was the kind of person who articulated um, what we could call Keynesian economics um, to a sort of mass audience. And that was the kind of position uh, I was in. I mean, these days, um, my, my equivalents would be reading Paul Krugman or Stiglitz or uh, people of that kind. Um, so I, I, it was my values and views that influenced my approach to economics rather than the other way around. Okay. Well, um, there was a 27 year gap between your first attempt at standing for parliament and then when you finally entered parliament. Um, I, I suppose, what on earth kept you going? What, what was the drive in you to keep well, actually, it? Actually, it was, a, there was, there was a positive to it. I mean, I, most, most of the people I guess who get into parliament are on some kind of conveyor belt. I mean, my contemporaries at university were people like Ken Clark, mm. uh, Norman Lamont, um, people of you know, really talented people, but it was fairly clear that even as undergraduates that they were heading for a political career, they left college, they did a few years doing a, a job somewhere in the city, um, they would then be adopted as a conservative candidate, they'd have one run and then they'd be given a safe seat. There was, there was a, a sort of career progression and I didn't see that. I mean, I, I did try for parliaments in different ways, but um, there was no kind of ready-made career. But the great advantage of that was, was that, first of all, I had plenty of time to spend with my family and I, you know, hope with bringing up my kids. And so I, I didn't miss out on that stage of life, as a lot of politicians do. But also, I did a lot of very varied things in, in economic research, in business, uh, in government. Um, so, I, you know, by the time I got into Parliament, I was fairly well rounded and, and had a you know good feel for economic policy and practice. And when you entered Parliament, was it what you expected after all of those years? Um, well, I got very irritated, and I still do, by, by the um, old-fashioned uh, yeah. customs. I mean, which are just a lot of which are silly. Um, you know, the idea that whenever you vote, it can be on a very small technical issue, you're spending 20 minutes, you know, queuing to vote and, you know, running along when the bells ring. Mm. You know, electronics and as, as, hasn't reached Parliament yet, at least in that respect. And, <coughs> and the conventions of the debating chamber, um, I mean, you have to have kind of discipline and order and respect, but it, it was in a, in a very tiresomely old fashioned way. It has modernized a bit, partly because we now have a lot more women, which is much healthier, and we have a more diverse parliament, but um, it's still, you know, 50 years behind uh, a modern, if, what I would think a modern efficient legislature should be like. Uh, you've said in the past that your interest in economic has, economics has to do with uh, the economic practicalities. When you were in Parliament, and I suppose as you rose through the ranks, did you, I suppose, f manage to get a real insight into economic practicalities? I mean, if that was one of your driving factors into politics. Yeah, yes, I, I did. Um, I mean, most of the economic students who follow you, uh, what you're doing, uh, 
will know that there is a bit of a dividing line between those who pursue kind of theoretical economics, which is very often complex model building, uh, rather mathematical, rather abstract. Um, that's in a way very often how you build your career um, in the theoretical journals. And those on the other hand, who are very down to earth, um, you know, perhaps not so theoretically demanding. And that was the, the, the bit of economics actually that interests me, the overlap between economics and policy and policy making. Mm -hmm. And when I got into Parliament, uh, I'd just come from Shell. I was their chief economist, which again was a very down to earth kind of role. Um, but when I got into politi into Parliament, I, one of the first things I did was to get onto the Treasury Select Committee, which probably the most interesting of the various select committees in Parliament. And you, you know, you interrogate the Chancellor every six months. Uh, we did an investigation into financial regulation. Um, you know that 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 kind of practical policy issue, and I, I did feel in my element in, in that kind of world. Well, you mentioned interrogating economists, and of course, the the head of the bank of uh, the central bank, chief of the central bank. Um, you were, of course, one of the few prominent individuals in this country who prophesied the financial crisis, earning you the moniker Doctor Doom. Uh, mm -hmm. How were you able to see what others didn't, and how did you remain uh, immune to groupthink? Well. Um... Uh, what I would claim was that for quite a long time before the crash, I had been warning about unsustainable elements in the banking sector and in housing. And so there was a kind of basic ins insight that was right. Um, what I didn't do and wouldn't claim to have done was to have been able to, to predict how the crisis happened, which of course happened in these uh, securitized markets, uh, these sort of global global markets with complex derivatives. I haven't really got my head around that aspect of it, but the fact that there was something unstable and obviously insecure in the way in which house prices were being built up, and you had very you know increasingly high risk mortgages at high levels of leverage, that that not too many people were saying that. And it did surprise me because I, I did actually go to see people like the governor of the Bank of England, talk to some of the leading bankers, and they they had shut their minds to the possibility that something could go terribly wrong. Um, so yeah, it was it was it was an eye opener that there was a kind of built in complacency, a belief that the great moderation, as it was called, would go on forever. But but. You didn't address the second part of my question there, which is how did you remain immune to groupthink? I mean, do you think of yourself as a maverick of an intellectual maverick? Well, it was partly that um, actually I saw an opportunity in being um, counter counter cultural um, and being, you know, taking an idiosyncratic point of view. And I got a certain amount of notoriety for it, which I also had one or two. Uh, people who worked with me in my treasury team, who, you know, Lord Oakshot was one, who were of the same mind. Um, so I had a small team of people around me who um, reinforced the kind of critical questions I was starting to ask. And I think you need that. You can't be totally isolated. You have to have a, you have to have a team. And, and did you take that approach with you when you went into government and your place as Secretary of State for Business? Uh, I, I did, but by then, of course, the bubble had already burst, and what we were dealing with were the practical problems of clearing up the mess. Um, I, I did try to engage directly with George Osborne, I had a reasonably good relationship with, and we, we discussed economic policy, uh, and I was on the critical side, I mean, I thought we should be doing more in terms of public investment, um, but but... You know, I, I wouldn't escape, want to escape my share of responsibility. I mean, I did take the view that the government had to show fiscal responsibility, uh, that we, we, we couldn't just keep spending freely. That's become a rather unfashionable, uh, quote, austerity approach. And um, I was um, up to my ears in that. Um, but I did, I did want, I, you know, there were times during the coalition when I did want the government to be taking a more expansionary uh, position than we did. And and you mentioned responsibility, but 
what about your own personal responsibility? Did you really get a sense or a feel for the kind of weight on your shoulders and the responsibility placed upon you to kind of sort out the mess that had happened? Yeah, it, it, it was, and it was very, very difficult because um, most major government departments, including mine, were taking something like a 20% cut in public spending, 20 to 25%, which was very, very painful. I mean, government departments have never been in that position within living memory. I mean, you, know, you were quite often previous governments were taking two to three percent out of their budget, but 20 to 25 percent was, um, you know, uh, um, unbelievable. And it was very painful. Uh, we, we actually cut the office overheads, in other words, the civil service, by about 40 percent. So I was directly dealing with people, a lot of whom were being reorganized and eventually losing their jobs. So my job was to try and manage this very large department. We have about 3,000 people at head office, numerous um, parastatal organizations associated with it. It was to try to explain what we were doing, to try to make sure there was a positive story while all these cuts were happening, um, to set out some objectives around the industrial strategy and so on, which kept the department motivated. But it was very, it was hard going. And of course, the most difficult um, problem of all, which you will be familiar with, was what we had to do with the universities, because the universities were already in financial difficulty. Um, the government cuts were going to mean that, that either they would, large numbers of them would have to cut departments or close down altogether because there was lack of government financial support or we were going to have to find another mechanism for doing it and that was to build on the fee loan system and that proved highly controversial because the Liberal Democrats had rather foolishly promised not to do it um, and you know the history there but it was going to be difficult in any event so that was the most traumatic um, and challenging bit of the job I had. Uh, well on keeping with the financial crisis theme, uh, lots of commentators have ascribed the political turbulence of the last decade across the world to the financial crisis. What kind of medium to long run political impact then do you think this COVID pandemic will have? And by that, I, I really mean, do you think we're in, in store for an even more tumultuous decade than the one just gone? And perhaps with the collapse of the union to start? Well, I think the answer to your question is yes, yes, and yes. Yes, I think all those things are right. Um, it certainly is true. I mean, I wrote a book at the time of the financial crisis called The Storm. And although some of the economics and finance may be a little bit um, wide of the mark, the one chapter where I, 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 I think what I said had real long-term meaning was that I was looking ahead to the political implications and I look back through history at some of the big financial upheavals of the past going back two to three centuries and after all of them after a, a time lag of several years there was often a very nasty populist swing um, of the kind we experienced between the wars um, in the financial crisis of the early 19th century uh, and has happened this time. So yeah, I didn't identify Trump and Brexit, but w w I could see that something like that was coming. Now, in terms of the future, I fear that we may be heading for something like that or worse, uh, because we already have in place a fair degree of economic nationalism, uh, the shutting of boundaries, and of course the COVID pandemic has made that happen for physical reasons as well as ideological reasons but um, the spirit of inward lookingness um, has certainly come to the top in the United States and I think it will persist even if Trump is defeated. I think the United States role as a sort of global leader and a kind of the liberal international economic order I mean is over. Um, we, we, we are looking at growing conflict with China I think foolishly i mean i know the chinese are not easy to love given a lot of the things they do but 
you know, they are the new economic superpower. We have to have a relationship with them. We have to work with them on climate change and issues of that kind. But the mood at the moment is for conflict and division. And I fear that may get quite a lot worse. So you don't think the, the conflict and the tension is well founded? Um, I would say there's a degree of paranoia that goes beyond uh, justified suspicion. I mean, there, there obviously is a different system and, you know, there are some very nasty aspects of it, as we know from uh, the treatment of the Uyghur Muslims and to some extent in Hong Kong. But we, we've always known that. I mean, the, the great uh, champion of modern China, Deng Xiaoping, one of the really great figures of the last century, um, and always made it very clear that he was in favour of economic liberalisation and creating a, a liberalised, successful, um, semi-capitalist economy in China, which he did, brilliant, but, it, but never at any stage um, led people to believe that China was going to liberalise politically. He publicly dismissed Gorbachev as a fool, uh, and indeed the history of the Soviet Union suggests that he wasn't too far at the mark. Um, that China was never going to follow the Western model. It hasn't, and no reason to assume it would. And we've got to deal with that reality, I think. So I think, yes, by all means, recognize that there's some very nasty things happening there. They're going through a stage of very prickly nationalism, and we can't just be completely passive about that. Uh, but at the same time, we do need to work with the Chinese. Um, they will be the world's largest economic power in the coming years. We need their cooperation on a whole variety of things around coordinating the world economy, climate change, dealing with debt in Africa, a whole set of issues. And so we've got to be grown up about it. And just finger pointing and uh, lecturing them doesn't help us. Do you think then that the kind of Western administrations, or the current Western administrations, are well equipped to further and advance that goal and aim, or is it beyond them? In that no, that's, that, that thing partly because of the, the dynamics of the Trump administration and the sort of populism. Um, we got into quite a bad place, um, but I, I, you know, it does worry me that that. I was one of the people who was rather critical of the way we dumped the relationship with Huawei, which is a perfectly good company. Um, maybe we're doing the same with TikTok over the next few days. It doesn't seem to me that uh, in order to defend Western interests and values, you have to get into that kind of economic conflict. Well, moving on then, um, you have said quite famously that the older generation, or spoke quite famously, that the older generations have betrayed the young on issues from Brexit to the environment. And in the wake of this pandemic, when children have lost out on months of education and graduates are entering a barren job mar jobs market, uh, this generational divide will only imaginably increase. Uh, you have spoken in support of varying the voting age to 16. What other actions should the government take now to alleviate this massive burden that young people are set to face? Yes, and I, I think you've said it very well, that there is a, an intergenerational equity, I know it's, it's a rather pompous phrase, uh, which lies at the heart of a lot of the current debates, particularly around COVID. I mean, essentially what's happening is that um, the economic prospects of young people is being, are being suspended and probably in many cases permanently damaged to lengthen the life expectancy of people like me. Um, and you know, the quest precisely where you strike the balance is, is difficult. Um, but I don't think we should ac not acknowledge that this is very, very tough for young people in general, um, particularly uh, people from disadvantaged backgrounds who've missed six months of school, uh, particularly badly hit, and they're not going to make up on that. Um, the fact that within a year or two years we're going to be dealing with 10% plus unemployment, it's going to be very difficult for people to enter the labour markets, whether they're graduates or unskilled, um, and we're going to have to find ways of dealing with that. Now, it's not easy, but, but obviously the, the government has got to produce this kind of employment maximisation strategy for the next stage of its recovery from COVID, 
I think tax policy has got to be have a generational aspect as well as a, a revenue raising aspect, uh, particularly the amount, the extent to which wealth is concentrated in property, uh, which is concentrated in the older generation. So taking a um, using the, the weapon of taxation to redistribute wealth and income is, I think, an important step and going to be a very difficult one because people of my generation tend to vote and many young people don't. And, and do, as I mentioned in my question, do you think by lowering the voting age to 16 that giving young people then be better represented, do you think that would make a kind of substantive difference? Yes, yeah, so I'd rather assume that we were in agreement on that and I didn't need to argue with you about it. But yes, of course, it, it, it is quite an important step. Um, but the Conservatives are very resistant because they don't think that they're going to get much from that generation. Um, I think a little unwisely because actually the, the 16 voting age did prove quite an important part of the Scottish uh, referendum and essentially there was not just a great deal of engagement but actually a lot of very mature decision making I and mean, in a way that's a good model of what happens when you do exchange the voting age downwards. Now um, the birds have been tweeting uh, that you've just finished a new book it's on economic policy makers and thinkers and I think set to release in the new year. Um, did you find anything common to the figures that you looked at in temperament, intellect or ambition and what if anything surprised you in your research? Um, no, finding common threads was quite difficult but the, the, the point I was trying to make in doing the book and it was strengthened actually by finishing it is that when we think about economic policy uh, particularly in talk courses at universities the focus is always on the economist you know it's on Adam Smith, Keynes, whatever, um, not on the guys who actually make the decisions. Mm -hmm. But if you, um, I started with Alexander Hamilton, who has quite a certain amount of fame because of the musical, but hitherto was completely unknown. But actually, more than George Washington, more than Jefferson, uh, more than Adams, you know, was actually the man who created the United States. And established its institutions and, and many of the values which inspired their economic policy. And similarly, um, I mean, the, the, the person who made Britain into a kind of open free trading country was, was Peel in the 19th century. And hitherto, Britain had been a very protectionist, inward-looking country. And we tend to forget it. We assume that Britain had always been leading the world in that it was not true. Um, but you had one politician who took a stand, a bit of luck, you know, a bit of coincidence, but actually totally transformed the way we did things. But, you know, I, I took, you know, economic he heroes from different bits of the political trajectory. Uh, I, I took Mrs. Thatcher as one who pushed through necessary, very politically controversial reforms. I used Earhart, who was another kind of free market economy who, economist who became Chancellor of Germany, uh, who made fundamental changes there. Deng Xiaoping, uh, Lee Kuan Yew in Singapore. Um, yeah. One of my, Lee Kuan Yew. But uh, I said Lenin. Did Lenin? Lenin was one of mine, yes, that's right. But we, we always remember Lenin as a, as a Marxist Leninist revolution, which of course he was, that's so why his name has been immortalized. But in in the last year of his life, he he totally transformed the economic policy in the Soviet Union. He introduced the new economic policy, which had a spectacular effect. He mobilized the peasants through giving them price incentives and so on. And that was the model that was ultimately used in China um, 60, 50, 60 years later with great success. And people have forgotten that aspect of Leninism. Yeah, it caused quite a stir on Twitter, I think, when you tweeted that out. That's that's how I knew. Or well, that's how yeah. I thought. <laughs> yes, no, he's, he's a sort of hate figure. Yeah. Uh, one of the things, amusing episodes, was when I, when I did um, make a, a, a tweet about that subject, one of the people who intervened was Michael Gove. I thought he was actually running the country, but anyway, he was watching my tweets and uh, came back with a strong riposte on Lenin. 
Uh, well, now finally, um, as I'm sure you're well aware, there is a vacancy to be Director General of the WTO. Uh, you described the government's nomination of Liam Fox as a joke, uh, and you also didn't recently rule out a return to politics and have appeared recently on a panel discussing how to reform the WTO. So Vince, would you like to be the Director General of the WTO? Uh, well, I would actually. I mean, there's no chance whatever that they, they would adopt me, but no, it's, it's a very important job. The, the world, we, we've taken for granted the fact that post-war prosperity, as long as it lasted, was heavily based on globalization and free, freedom of trade. And in many ways, it was a great success story. Uh, and kind of Roosevelt and the post-war Americans launched the system. And, um, you know, even the European Union, that was initially a very inward-looking, rather protectionist bloc, made a very constructive um, contribution to it. The Chinese joined the world economy after uh, joining the WTO and accepting its rules. Uh, the Japanese have opened their economy. I, I would argue that many developing countries have prospered through the WTO. So its current state of drift um, is very worrying and it does need a good director general. I, I wasn't trying to mock Mr. Dr. Fox and no strong feelings one way or the other, but the way in which the nomination was made um, it clearly won't get any support in Europe, which you, you need to, to get a post of that kind. Um, the, the post will almost certainly go to uh, an African, I would have thought. And there are some very good candidates, particularly um, Amina Mohammed from Kenya, but there are several others. Uh, and I've thought Britain should be using such influences how to get behind the best of those, rather than trying to push our own in a rather quixotic way. Thank you very much um, for a fascinating talk. Uh, it's been a delight to have you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.